This morning's lesson is simply called the manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God. You know, when we look out into the religious world, it is filled with churches. It's filled with churches. You go through this town and that town and you keep driving and you see church after church after church. But the sad part of that is that most people know very little about the church we read about in the Bible. Even many members of the Lord's church know little about its importance or about how distinctive the church of the Bible really is. And of course, this may be because, or a partial cause, may be due to not understanding or appreciating God's purpose in the church. Because God had a purpose in the church and He planned it from the very beginning of time. One writer put it like this, It is as though the apostle takes us into the throne room of the Godhead and allows us to witness the sacred three in divine counsel concerning the spiritual welfare of mankind. Our text this morning takes us there and paints a picture of how God's wisdom is seen in the church of our Lord. Our text today is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. We're going to read that as a whole, and then we're going to look at three principles, three ideas that come from that text that are important for all of us today, that's here, and it's important for everyone in the world. Everyone in the world needs to know about God's wisdom and how it was shown in the church that He planned. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, To me, and remember, this is the Apostle Paul writing this to the church at Ephesus, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Notice in the first two verses he talks about the church that was hidden in God. We see that Paul's heart was a very humble one. He didn't think he deserved to be an apostle. He knew that it was by God's mercy that he was an apostle. He didn't think he was better than the other saints. He didn't think he was a super saint or a super Christian. He was just thankful that he had been given this grace. We talked last Sunday morning about this grace that Paul was able to reveal to the world. And that was, of course, the fact that all people could now be in Christ and they could enjoy all of these wonderful blessings that he's been talking about ever since Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Regardless of where that person came from, it didn't make any difference if they came from a Jewish background, a Gentile background, Paul had been given this grace to reveal the mystery, this mystery that had been hidden in God. And he had the privilege, the privilege, the honor of revealing that mystery. And he was so appreciative of that fact. He felt privileged to preach, as he called it, the unsearchable riches of Christ. He was given that wonderful responsibility, that wonderful privilege, that wonderful honor of preaching those, as he calls them, unsearchable. In what way were they unsearchable? We understand why they're called riches because of their tremendous value. Think about, first of all, the value of those blessings he's talked about. Redemption, forgiveness, being in Christ, being in, as Paul calls them, the beloved. 
and blessing after blessing after blessing, and he calls these riches. Why are they unsearchable? Because it makes no difference how long or how often you think and contemplate and meditate and focus on all of these wonderful riches. We will never, never this side of heaven be able to understand the vastness of them. In this life, we can't understand how amazing the idea that God has wiped away our sins. We just can't contemplate that. We know it. The Bible tells us we, we know that our sins are forgiven. But it's beyond us. We just can't fathom the depth of what that means. Redemption. He redeemed us. He paid the ransom for us. I, I can't fathom how rich that is. This side of heaven. But one day, one day I'll understand how vast that is. I'll be able to understand how amazing that is. Right now, my, my uh, human mind just can't fathom it. I just can't. One day, I will. So Paul calls him, Paul says, I was given the privilege of preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable. And people need to know about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul said, I am so privileged to be able to tell people about it. And of course, we should be as well. Paul had a purpose, he says. That purpose was to reveal the mystery. And he says that mystery had been hidden in God. He says it had been hidden from the beginning of the ages. From the beginning of the ages, it had been hidden. So he was to reveal this mystery to all people. That God's plan was to unite in one man, Christ Jesus, was to unite all men. It made no difference whether they came from a Jewish background, a Gentile background. That There was no distinction anymore. There wasn't a distinction between free and slave, Jew and Gentile, male and female, that salvation was available to all. That's part of those unsearchable riches. It wasn't just for one group or class of people. But Paul revealed the fact that everybody could be united in the one body, that church of Christ. His body. That's what Paul was revealing. And he says that had been hidden in God. It had been a mystery. We talked last week about what a mystery was. It was something that was not revealed yet. But then Paul was given, as the other writers of the New Testament were, the privilege of uncovering it. So that everybody now can be a part of that great body of of Christ. Paul was so thankful he could do that. Because people in the Old Testament, Noah, Abraham, David, they didn't have an understanding of the church. They didn't have an understanding of salvation being in the body of Christ. They didn't understand that. As we see in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about how people in the Old Testament desired that, but didn't Understand it. First Peter chapter 1 verse 10 says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you, through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Those great prophets, those great men of the Old Testament did not have an understanding of the church. But Paul and the others now have revealed all of that. All can now understand the importance, the necessity of the church. 
And that is something that we must continue to tell the world. So many in the world will say, Jesus, yes, the church, no. You cannot separate those two. You cannot do it. The world tries, but it's impossible. That was one of the things Paul was revealing. People are united. Where? In his body. Which he said back in Ephesians 1 was what? The church. We cannot separate them. We can't. Even though the world tries so hard. The second thing, and one of the most, I think the one of the most incredible verses about the church in all the New Testament is verse 10. I'm going to read it again. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. He says it's the intent, it's the purpose. This was not an accident. This was God's plan. He had a definite plan through the church. It was not an afterthought. And what he says is the manifold wisdom of God can be made known by the church. By looking at the church. Manifold wisdom. I, when, I always, when I think about the word manifold the idea of many-sided or multifaceted. I think about a diamond. And you see all the different little faces of the diamond and how beautiful it is. That's the idea of the manifold wisdom of God. The many-sided wisdom of God is seen in the church. It is revealed by looking at the church. We can see a part of God's wisdom... Of course, by looking at the world, we can see that, that God is, is wise in how he, how he designed the earth and designed plants and designed animals and designed man and designed the, the heavens and so forth. We can see part of, in a very limited way, God's wisdom. But his full wisdom that we can comprehend is seen in his plan of redemption for mankind. His multifaceted, many-sided wisdom. And it is made known by or through the church. Paul is saying this, if you really want to see God's wisdom, look at the church in Scripture. Look at the church in Scripture. You will see God's infinite wisdom. Notice, first of all, its founder and head is Christ, the only sinless human being. Notice God's wisdom there. Its organization is simple. Each congregation is self-governing. There is no organization beyond the local church. Each church is what we call autonomous. It governs itself. Elders, deacons, and teachers and preachers, and so forth. We see the wisdom of not having this large organization beyond the local church. Its worship is simple, it's dignified, it's not elaborate, and it's designed to bring honor and glory to God. We see God's multifaceted wisdom by looking at how the church worships. Its plan of salvation, it's simple, it's straightforward, it's available to any and all who are willing to come to Christ with an obedient faith. It doesn't make any difference where you were born, it doesn't make any difference how you were raised, it doesn't make any difference who your parents were, it doesn't make any difference about how much money you have, none of those things matter. The only thing that matters is if you're willing to come to Christ in obedience. See, it's simple, it's straightforward. All of these things shows God's manifold wisdom. From the very beginning, we see this in His church. No wonder it's called the fullness of Christ. And then the third thing is that the church is in God's eternal purpose. We saw in verse 11 where it says, According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It was God's eternal purpose. His eternal purpose. This was not done on a whim. The world needs to hear that. 
The existence of the church, the distinctiveness of the, of the church, the worship of the church, all of these things, these were not done on a whim. They weren't an accident. God planned from the very beginning that the church would exist. That's how important it is. Jesus, yes, the church, no, absolutely not. The church is essential to salvation. Absolutely essential. And we're talking about the church revealed in the New Testament. It was an integral part of God's plan for man's redemption. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't a sort of substitution that so many people think today. So many teach erroneously that the church was a substitute. That God didn't know the Jews were going to reject Christ. And so when they did, he had to put into play a substitute plan. And the substitute plan was the church. Not so. The Bible very emphatically says that the church was planned before the beginning of time. It was part of God's plan for man's redemption. All the way back in the book of Isaiah, more than 700 years before the time of Christ, the church was prophesied about. In Isaiah chapter 2, we'll just read two verses there. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 Isaiah writes this, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Notice what was predicted. The mountain of the Lord's house would be established. It would be established in the latter days. All nations would flow into it. And the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. All of those things, all of those things began to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The Lord's house is the Lord's church. Just look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said that there in the first century, that these were the latter days. Peter, an inspired apostle, said those were the latter days. The latter days aren't something in the future, right before Christ comes. That's not the latter days. That's not biblical. The latter days started way back in the first century. The Great Commission did what? It included all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. All nations would flow into the church, and of course they have. And the word of the Lord would go forth from where? Jerusalem. That's where it was started, Acts chapter 2. Those people were gathered there in Jerusalem to observe the feast. Any cost. So Isaiah's prophecy, back in Isaiah chapter 2, more than 700 years before the birth of Christ, predicted the beginning of the church. And it was established and started just exactly like Isaiah prophesied that it would. And he ends in those last two verses in our text by talking about the fact that we have boldness, Access with confidence through faith in Christ. Again, it's in Christ, His body, the church, that we have boldness and access with confidence. People outside the church do not have that same access. They do not have that same boldness. We are privileged. We are privileged. We have tremendous blessings, unsearchable riches, by being in Christ. Boldness, confidence, access to God. What a blessing. And they are available where? In Christ, in His church. He ends it by saying, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations. He didn't want them to become discouraged. Remember, Paul's in a, 
a prison. He's in chains as he's writing this. He didn't want them to become discouraged because of his sufferings. He said they would receive eternal glory one day. And it's that same glory that awaits all who are in the body of Christ, the church. Those who remain faithful to the end, the Lord's church, what the Bible calls the church of Christ, is the only religious body that exists with God's approval. There's only one. And that's why I started this lesson by saying it's with sadness when we look out into the world and see all the divisions, all these churches that teach and preach vastly different things. I can almost see God's tears because that's not what he wants. He has one church, one church. And all of those are a part of it who have came to Christ in obedient faith. And all of those in that church, all of them, partake of all of those blessings that Paul has gone over and over and over again about forgiveness and redemption and the ransom being paid and being part of the beloved, part of that one body. He couldn't emphasize it enough. We cannot accept substitutes. We cannot accept substitutes because the church is essential to God's plan for our salvation. That means it's essential to yours. It's essential. And that was God's plan for everything. From the very beginning of time. And when we come to Him in obedience... When we're willing to repent and confess his name and be immersed in water for our sins, we are placed in his body, the church. And therein we, we enjoy the unsearchable riches of Christ. That wonderful family, the house of God. This morning, you may need to respond to that great invitation. Or maybe you're a part of that wonderful family of God and you are in need of prayers. You need to confess and, and ask for forgiveness. If that's your need, then we encourage you to come as we stand and sing this song.